Now let's continue uh, the lecture of yesterday. Uh, today we want to move. Um, we want to move towards what I call massively parallel spike trains. <sighs> I would say more than 10 is almost massively parallel. No, no, but 100 or so. And as you can imagine, this is so to say uh, not straightforward to extend the methods we were using before. And I would like to suggest you a few which we worked out and which you may want to use for the data challenge. Oops. So to remind you, this is what I would consider massively parallel data. And um, the tasks you will have then for the next three days is, as I said yesterday, the data is the so-called data challenge, that you will have uh, six data sets, and we give you this afternoon the features of these data sets, and your goal is to find this out, which is which. And uh, we will have um, then a report on this, I think, on Friday morning. And then, after successful, <laughs> uh, ses successful identification, you will get the real, you, you will know which is the real data, and you can also get the uh, local field potentials. To work with this on a neuroscientific question, yeah? So, so we, we had this the in the last courses kind of mixed, and this was not so successful. So, um, and we would also like you to form groups, teams, also today for solving these questions. And we have basically more or less uh, four places where the groups can meet separately and discuss and so on. I think this is important to exchange each other. And you can already have this a little bit in the back of your mind. Um, with whom and so on, then a group could go in this room, another group could go in this room, one group could be here and one in the back, or you only form three groups. But um, I would strongly suggest to work in groups. Um, more brains are better. Okay, and um, so we will now go into this massively parallel data and a question which comes immediately up when you start thinking about this is, do we, have, uh, do we deal only with pairwise? So these are four neurons, these are sketches, this is time, this is the four neurons in parallel. And now you can think of different kind of correlations between these neurons. So for example, in this case, um, these neurons always all have pairwise correlations. They are all pairwise correlated. And um, this may happen, but you may have also only triple correlations. Yeah? You see this in, in terms of, uh, it's a sketch, a very, uh, um, you, you see that all there are constellations, different constellations of three uh, neurons synchronized with synchronized activity. And basically, you have different types of triple correlations. Or in this case, all these neurons are firing synchronously together. And why do you want to know that? Well, um, I would like to know that because I would like to know which neurons are forming an assembly. Yeah. So here I would say all these four form an assembly. But here I would say it's different groups of three which form assemblies, yeah? And I would like to distinguish this from a mere pairwise correlation. Or in other words, what I also want to say is, in case you look just as pairwise correlations and, and notice that you find, uh, as here, um, a case of four neurons, all pair-to-pair -pair co pairwise correlated, this does not necessarily mean that A exhibit altogether a higher order correlation. Now, I'm a bit sloppy with my definition of higher order 
because the mathematics, there are some approaches to do this, but what I mean is, um, so to say, correlations, let's say, of four neurons, which is not explained by pairwise or triplewise correlation. There are mathematical frameworks which we tried, cumulants, for example, which are, so to say, um, mathematical weight. These are kind of um, higher order um, features of data, but um, this becomes immediately so complicated. Um, even for a correlation of four, you have that terms, and it's very hard for the amount of data we, we have available typically in experimental data to, to approach this in the, in the, in the sort of say, strict mathematical way. This is why I suggest uh, different methods. Now it's becoming a bit fresh, I'm sorry. Um, which are not that, how should I say, uh, correcting for lower order correlations, but, um, but indirectly. Okay, so what I also wanted to emphasize um, that when you want to generate or uh, design a method and you want to build on the pairwise analysis method, for example, unitary events or so, or, um, ah, no, this is something else. Uh, I wanted to say uh, that uh, if this, but I said this before already, that if you want to conclude on higher order correlations, you cannot do this from only pairwise correlation. You, wo you will miss it. But what you need to do, as I said, higher order correlation analysis. And the difficulty is that scaling up, for example, the unitary event analysis to a large number of neurons leads to a combinatorial explosion of parameters. So if you uh, want to see all different constellations of neurons across this 100 parallel recordings, you have two, 2 to the power of n, n equals 100 neurons. <coughs> <coughs> this would be so, so many, many, many different uh, constellations. And for this, you simply don't have the data available. In addition, you run into a massive multiple testing problem um, if you want, for example, to test for the individual patterns. We touched this issue already yesterday. This means um, if you ask many questions to uh, one data set, for example, if you would be interested in testing for each individual pattern constellation, but have, a, for example, a significance level of 5% or so, due to the number of questions you are asking, you would get anyway 5% significant. And um, this, and the more, of course, the more questions you ask, uh, the more uh, significant results you get. This, of course, you don't want. So first of all, you want to avoid uh, massive, signi uh, massive uh, significance testing on the same data, and second, there are correction methods which then, so to say, reduce the significance level in extreme Bonferroni that you divide the significance level by the number of questions you ask. Yeah? So for example, if you ask 1,000 questions and then you have a significance level of 5%, then you the significance level is so low that nothing will become significant. So and uh, but this would be the super strict method, but there are also other ones available. Um, and so we started <coughs> about 15 years ago with development of statistical methods to analyze such massively parallel spike trends. Now the first approach actually cons cons suggested to me by Wolf Singer was uh, he said, why don't you just look at the population activity? Yeah? And I started to think about this, and um, actually it's a quick way of looking at data to get a hint if there is higher order correlation available in some sense, and then you can later on dig into this and 
focus and try to find out which neurons and so on. So this is based now on a paper I had actually my only paper I have with Moshe Abeles. Uh <laughs> so um, you I can also provide this to you. So what we did here. So this is only um, uh, simulated data to make to really know what we are doing. So these are, for example, 100 parallel spike trains uh, simulated as Poisson processes with a given rate. And um, in addition, we inserted into 20 of them, not, not in addition, we inserted into 20 of them, you see here these highly synchronous events, and compensated the rates of the background correspondingly such that all of these neurons had the same firing probability. Um, if you randomize the neuron IDs, you can hardly see these events. This is something you should realize because it's not something that you look at it and you see it immediately. Yeah? And what we mean by population histogram is to bin the time axis, let's say in one or five millisecond bins, and um, sum the number of spikes across the neurons. Yeah, this is what I mean by a population histogram. And then what you can see here easily, you have when, when the mere independent background, you get relatively low entries here, but here and then when we actually meet um, this uh, higher order event, we have a high entry. Super. And if you have independent data, which you could, in a s uh, if you have I if you have a stationary data, you could simply randomize the spike times. Then this looks like this. Okay. Um, then we thought maybe we should use um, uh, we should then look at the distribution of these entries, and we call these entries complexity, and we form the distribution of all these counts and compare it then to the independent case. Yeah? We learned yesterday you can make your data independent in one or the other smart way. So this you can then do always. And it's a simple computation. No, I don't think so. So what you now see is this is the distribution normalized. This is, so to say, the probability to find a certain complexity um, in there. And what you mainly see here is that you have a peak there on low complexities, but the inserted, <laughs> the inserted uh, synchrony of 20 is not kind of does not appear in detail. If you look at the uh, independent data, this looks more or less the same by eye, at least. But what we thought we could do is to take a binwise difference, a binwise difference, and then this appears like this. So here is actually what we expected somehow to see. These are, so to say, um, these, co these synchronized events of we inserted 20, but what you probably see is that the peak is a bit higher at a higher value. Why is this? Some idea? Maybe I show you the dot display again. So in these 20, we had inserted these events of 20. But why do we get maybe sometimes 21, 22, 23? So these inserted events may by chance meet background spikes. Yeah, exactly. So um, this is why this is a bit broader. Now, why does this look like this? Why do we have here uh, a negative peak? Exactly. Exactly. So because this is normalized, yeah, it's a probability distribution, the spikes that are here are have to be taken from somewhere or are taken from somewhere, and this leads to a, a negative uh, dip. 
And what I can tell you from experience is that mainly, uh, it, this is often very hard to see, but if you see something like this, you know there is something going on. So there is some higher order correlation going on. Now, huh? Yeah. So interesting idea, yes. Yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah, it's a good idea. We can think about whether this is helpful and wh how we can use this. Yeah, that's an interesting idea and you are welcome to implement this. So I uh, uh yeah, and and show me what what you found and so on, yeah. Of course. Um, I just want to tell you for this simple case, Ponson and so on, and insertion and so on, y there you, you can ha uh, have, and, and you find this in this paper, analytical description. This is bain mainly dealing with, um, with binomial distributions and products of or fa uh, convolution of binomial distributions. If you do it just to get the idea, if you reorganize this, this is what we actually did. We gave these neurons the same firing rate. And what we did here is that we reduced the background activity by the coincidence rate yeah, to have all these neurons also the same rate. And um, now uh, to make a calculation to derive what we would expect, we you can reorder them that you deal these segments differently. This is, this is basically the idea because it's independent of the when it occurs in time. Yeah? It's just to give you an idea how you can approach this. Okay, what can we do with it? So um, now we come to this, <laughs> to this issue of chitter and dither. <laughs> so, um, so let's assume you have data and you want to know, uh, for example, whether um, whether there is higher order correlation involved and of what, what order. What you can then do is, for example, vary the bin size, yeah, perform a complex this difference of the complexity distributions for a bin width of two and three and four, and this is here now shown in a, in a color plot. Yeah? So, and what you can see here is that um, this, uh, positive negative from the beginning is well separated from this feigned entry here and at some point they kind of run together. Now, um, uh, so you can try to detect um, the, the order of the correlation from, from this second line. Uh, if you actually want to also identify the temporal chitter of your data. So if there is an imprecision, let's focus on this. Um, otherwise, it's becoming too difficult. Uh, I did not explain all the rest. So if um, you your temporal da your data have um, your data have a temporal jitter, So if uh, the group, you, ha you have inserted a group here of 20, as we had before, and the data had different uh, temporal jitters, like uh, being synchronized with uh, within one millisecond, two, three, and four. So now if we vary here the bin width for the analysis, we will notice somehow if the second of the second peak, an, a kink. And the reason for that is the following. Let's assume um, you increase more and more 
uh, the bin width, you start to collect more and more of your of your higher order e events somehow and um, by chance and then at some point you capture um, you capture the inserted events and by further increasing uh, the bin size you are only collecting additional background activity and this is why here the slope is changing considerably meaning if you are able to identify this this kink here you can tell what the temporal jitter is because you know when you have captured all the events and also the group size or the complexity of your data give it a try and let me know uh, how it looks like and how much you can derive from this very easy it's not so time consuming for computation and for the tasks you will get this afternoon it may be helpful okay um uh, this is what i said simple measure easy to compute you you surrogates for implementing the null hypothesis it can give you an indication of existent correlation and group size and you can uh, use a variation of the temporal of bin size to provide the temporal jitter now um, now we want to get a step further we want to somehow uh, scale this up and identify the neurons that are involved in significant patterns and um, I learned at some point from a computer scientist um, he was talking about um, a supermarket basket analysis. I don't know if you know about that. So people somehow, the supermarkets seem to be interested to know what people buy together. So that they buy typically wine and cheese and some bread together. And this they use to place the, the products in the supermarket that it's easier for you or that you buy more. And um, <coughs> we were able, together with, his name is not here because he's one of the last authors, Christian Borgelt, to, um, to make use of this approach to products in a market basket analysis to a spike train analysis. Because then I said, I mean, we have a similar problem if I consider each neuron as another product, so to say. Um, as another identity and um, then the set of products would be the set of neurons which are active at a certain time bin and so we were, um, were able to, to apply and translate this approach which is called um, where is it uh, frequent item set mining to um, to the uh, spike train analysis, the pat synchrony pattern analysis of uh, parallel spike trains. So effectively, this frequent item set mining is an efficient way of counting different, pattern, pa different patterns. Mining is just counting. Yeah? When we have counted them, we still don't know whether these are significant or not. Yeah? So this is a pre-step. What we do then, in order to perform our significance analysis, um, we do the following. So um, from such a data set, again, this is again a simulated data set with 100 neurons and 20 neurons being synchronized, we perform, we apply the frequent item set mining to it, and then we get a list of a lot of counts, yeah? And this we enter now in this particular histogram. It's a bit difficult to explain. So what we do is we categorize <coughs> each of our patterns we found into their size, or fo formerly we called it complexity, so the number, of the number of spikes involved in a pattern and their number of occurrences. Yeah? So you may have a pattern of neuron one, two, three occurring five times. And yeah. For 
I don't have this number of spikes because my bin size is small enough. Or if I do my bin size, uh, make it a bit bigger, then I, uh, then I clip it. Yeah? Because if you start to have different counts, you can do this. But then your patterns become really more difficult. Then it's not only neuron 1, 2, and 3, but neuron 1 uh, count having two spikes, and neuron 3 having five, and so on. Then your, your space explodes much more than here. Yeah, but if you are interested in something like this, we need to think about how you could do that. Yeah, but here we typically have one spike per neuron. Yeah. Now what we do is so, for example, we said occurring five times, right? So what is going to uh, enter in in this bin? In this bin, we count how many patterns there are of. Um, of size 2, of two neurons involved, occurring five times. So we don't count how often a certain pattern occurs, but um, if a pattern occurs with size 2 and occurring for five times, this adds to this bin. And the reason why we build up such a matrix um, where we pool certain patterns is because of um, um, because of this multiple testing problem. Because in the next step, we want to know if an entry in this matrix is occurring significantly more often than expected by chance uh, or just by chance. Yeah? And we need to ask less, qu less questions about 10 by 10 or 10 by yeah? But still, we I will come back to this. Um, I we will also correct for multiple testing. Okay. Now, how do we want to do uh, the significance analysis? Well, we do it quite similarly as yesterday. We generate surrogates from our original data and do exactly the same analysis on these surrogates. Exactly the same, multiple times. In order. So in here, in this case, we, uh, we apply a dither again. And what we then get is a matrix which gives you, so to say, the probability to find uh, patterns with uh, f occurring five times composed of, of two neurons uh, with a certain probability. And you see the dark part here means, well, they anyway occur by chance. Yeah? But if you are here in the whitish part, the, the probability to find them by chance is extremely low. Yeah? That's the philosophy. So basically what you can see is by chance, um, you get anyway patterns which are of uh, low size and relatively low, uh, either low size and uh, may occur a bit more often or vice versa. Now we compare the entries of this empirical matrix to this and ask for each entry, is it uh, occurring more of significantly more often than giving a significance level of 1% or so, and also correct uh, the entries with um I forgot the name. Not Bonferroni, but uh, another correction due to the multiple testing, and then we get a result like this. Yeah. So now here we have uh, red entries, which show these bins contain data which occurred significantly more often than expected by chance. Now we are not completely done here, because what we inserted here where patterns of a complexity of 10 occurring that many times. So what are these others here? Yeah. Um, so these others are patterns which are actually composed of uh, the pattern we included, plus a chance background spike, or sub-patterns of it. And actually, we wanted to get rid of this, and we wanted really to get back the one which we inserted. And for this, we added uh, a particular step, 
where we asked ourselves, well, this is, has the highest probability to occur. Can we explain the occurrence probability for this times, if this, <laughs> if this pattern is explained by the occurrence probability of this times getting a chance background spike as well, then we say this is, so to say, a false positive in a certain sense, that it, it uh, has a coincidence between the, uh, the significant pattern plus a background spike. So it's a conditional filtering what we add in this case. And um, when we do this, we end up then with our inserted pattern. But we had a discussion with Moshe the other day, and he said maybe you don't want to uh, remove these. We can discuss about this, and uh, maybe I come back to this point why we discussed it. After. You need to first know which are the patterns which have a high probability beyond chance to, to compare this um, mutual conditional. And you would have many much too many. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Yeah? No, we only, then we say this, part, so we look into this bin, and then you will notice anyway that you, because there will be only one type of pattern, composed of, yes, because by chance they don't occur. Yeah? So th this is our experience. <laughs> um, yes, that's true. That's true, that's true. It could be, yeah. Uh, what was your question? No, we would only extract here a pattern composed of 10. Well, this, um, um, this pre-step, this frequent item set mining, is only extracting the biggest patterns. Yeah? This, might, this is the pre-step. Okay. Just to give you a little bit of feeling, so we did quite a lot of calibrations of the method, which we use uh, when we do, when we develop methods, we test them for different scenarios with ground truth data. And here, for example, you see the effect of pattern occurrence for different firing rates, just to give, give you a feeling. So th this is, of course, then also considered in the, in the p-value and the significance test. You see that the higher the firing rate, the larger is this area which, uh, uh, of patterns to be generated by chance. Yes? So we have tested this as well, yeah, in homogeneity across neurons. And our impression was, or what we uh, tested was, that this is not affecting the method. Yeah? But you need to make sure that your surrogates have the same inhomogeneity. Yeah? Otherwise, you. Uh, change more features of the data than the one you want to test for. Okay. Now I can show you an application. Yes, please. Different patterns where? Redundant, you meant you meant this one? Um, it's basically like this. If you have found a pattern, which is, now I don't remember the color coding. If 
if you have a pattern which has, has the highest occurrence probability of the significant ones. So for example, this one occurred six times and the other had a lower probability. Well, but this has a lower chance to occur because it has only three spikes. You compare any two of these patterns, whether the larger one, for example, can be explained by the probability of this 10 neurons times the occurrence probability of a background spike of neuron 28. Yeah? And if this probability, this multiplication, explains the occurrence for this, that this occurs two times, then we say this is, this is, so to say, a false positive, composed actually for uh, by the other one. And you can do this also for sub-patterns. Yes, I, I agree, but, but sometimes you only have the longest, uh, the sh also shorter ones, which, which then survive. But their probability to occur, if you count a certain pattern's uh, length, is then relatively high if you anyway have a pattern, in s uh, a, pattern uh, a significant pattern. You cannot only remove uh, this. This is a matter of the counting of the frequent item set mining, which leads to this. Yes. Because, I don't know. <laughs> Good question, I don't know in the moment. So, I wanted to show you an application of this method. The method is called SPADE and it was published um, basically Mir, this this was the mir background, uh, so the mir method, and here we this is the application to the experimental data. So we used, um, t I think, in total, um, we used in total ten sessions of two monkeys. In the task you get got already introduced, uh, again, uh, actually the monkey was supposed to do a different grip with a different force and uh, the, the experimental protocol was that the monkey initiates the trial start himself when he's ready to go. Then he gets a cue with the information given by the constellation of uh, the LEDs uh, lighted on, either precision grip or side grip. Then he has to wait for a thousand milliseconds and then he gets in with the go signal uh, also the information of the with what force he has to pull then the object. Then he releases a center key. This is basically the reaction time, and then moves its arm to the object. This is the touch of the object, and it then he pulls it and holds it in a certain position. Yeah. We wanted to know <coughs> whether. Um, whether there are, so to say, patterns occurring, synchronous patterns occurring, are they specific to different behaviors, and so on. And what we did here is because the spade method, because of these many surrogates, is quite uh, computationally expensive, so we could not do directly, as for the unitary event analysis, a sliding window approach. But we segmented the data into relevant, what we thought, um, behaviorally relevant periods. Yeah? So around the start, around the queue, early in the delay, late in the delay, 
during the movement aligned on switch release and during the hold of the ob object. And these segments are all 500 milliseconds long. And these are, so to say, separately applied for the different behavioral conditions. Side grip high force, side grip low force, precision grip high force, precision grip low force. Yeah? And for each of these conditions, we have about 30 trials. So when we analyze the data, we take, for example, <coughs> the period around switch release of PG low, low force from all the trials and analyze this together as one data set. Meaning we have in total of, of one experiment of 15 minutes, we have four times six data sets, which we analyze according to the segmentation and ex extract for each of them the patterns if we find some. Okay, this is how we do that. Um, now, this I told you already. Now here you see an example of one session uh, what kind of patterns we found. This is from the whole session. And what you see here now, it's it also, you notice already patterns are, hmm, you need to deal with uh, vi visualizing them and so on. But what we see here already is that, for example, the pattern zero is composed of this neuron and that neuron. Pattern one of this neuron and that neuron and pattern two is composed of that neuron and that neuron, and so on. And what you realize already is that these patterns are much smaller than I assumed in my simulations. They have maybe two at most, this one, three spikes involved. And I will come back to this, why this may be the case. But these are, in general, the patterns we found, for example, in one uh, session, yes? First of all, you cannot necessarily conclude whether this is a monosynaptic, uh, but uh, to be honest, I didn't look at the cross chromosomes. Wait a second, why is this relevant? Why would this be relevant for you? So um, I think they, I still hope that they are coming <laughs> from a syn file chain, which is, so to say, being a, s a cell assembly, but that, our sem that but our assembling is not so good. I'll come back to this. We had a calculation on that. Um, let me continue a little bit. So, um, and when you uh, look at when these individual patterns occur in the experiment, you have now, <coughs> you have now, um, so to say, how should I explain, the different epochs, the different trial types, and when the particular pattern occurred and was significant. So what you can see here already that these patterns typically were significant and occurred at different epochs, and typically um, also in different, in different trial types. Um, we had then we did a lot of statistics on these patterns which occurred. For example, this is monkey L and monkey N. So what we did here is as a function of these epochs. And here you see, for example, the number of patterns occurring in different colors for the different uh, behaviors occurring in the different epochs. And one thing which is quite obvious here already, and this holds for both monkeys, that they mostly occur during, during the movement period. Um, and it's the amount of pattern seems to be more or less equally distributed across the different trial types. Also, the size of the patterns does not vary so much. Uh, this is now statistics across 10 sessions of each of the monkey. Um, 
The size does not vary so much, so it's also not particular. Um, the number of occurrences of these patterns may be relatively high, but they are also not specific. And then we also looked, here is a better display, at the occurrence probability of these patterns um, as a function of the distance on the array. Come back to this. Yeah. Um, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I was thinking and <laughs> so <laughs> okay, so um just to give you an idea how probable it is to find significant patterns as a function of distance on the array. And you see that for both monkeys, the uh, occurrence probability decays very much with distance. And basically on a distance of about above 4.4 millimeters, this is more or less diagonal, you don't find any anymore. So it's a matter of distance which you can imagine that this is natural because of the um, connection probability in space also decays. However, faster, actually. And um, single units, single units. OK. Now we were also interested, um, is there a certain how do they occur on cortex, so to say? Yeah. So to put them back onto onto the array, yeah, and see when do where do these patterns occur and with which orientation and so on. And here again for two monkeys, here is the general probability of finding patterns across the array. Here we put for each pair of neurons within a pattern the orientation where they occurred, yeah on the array and if you um and what we found is that there is actually for the patterns a preferred orientation on the array yeah so for example they are preferably mediolateral occurring um almost identical almost very similar for both monkeys and uh, what we thought but could not test yet that this may be related to what Hatsopoulos was showing and others with this propagating waves in the motor cortex. Yeah? Because we know, I showed you yesterday um, a slide, we knew that, or we know that um, significant patterns seem to write on, on the face of an oscillation. And so this may be the reflection of uh, spikes riding on this of this wave of the oscillation. Sorry, I forgot to tell. Three milliseconds. <coughs> no, I the idea was, I think I had a figure which was so showing this, uh, this hypothesis. Sorry, I forgot to put it here. Um, no, the idea, the idea would rather be this, that if you have waves going like this, ah, sorry. If you have uh, waves going in this direction on the LFP, that we see, so to say, spikes riding together on this. That they are synchronous on, on a, so to say, a high peak of this oscillation. That's, so to say, the guess. But let me go a little bit further. We were interested, this was a question before, we were interested whether a pattern um, is specific to the behavior. Is a if 
if there were groups of neurons um, particularly processing a certain behavior, we, we would expect that they exhibit these patterns which are specific to behavior. That's the philosophy. And so we made, uh, we calculated the specificity and it gets a value of one if a pattern occurred only in one epoch and in a particular behavioral condition or if they are distributed in different epochs, behavioral epochs, we give a specificity of zero. <coughs> and this is the analysis of it. Again, the different epochs. Um, the number, uh, the probability, the, the specificity of a particular, of the particular patterns. And for example, this is pretty clear that that these neurons seem to be very specific to the precision grip, uh, to the grip type, not so much on the, um, on the force level. This is why when we look at the combination of, <coughs> of uh, grip type and force type, that this is uh, going lower because this is reducing the specificity. But during um, during the, uh, the, the trial type, we noticed that they are highly specific, in particular in the later part of the experiment. So it seems that different assemblies are active for different behavior. Okay, that's our conclusion. Um, however, you could also ask, well, some of these patterns were overlapping quite strongly. Yeah, For example, there were comments by common neurons in these patterns um, and we applied a kind of a cluster uh, on cluster those and then looked at their specificity. Yeah? So we were asking, is this actually a bigger pattern? Do they belong to the same assembly but are different expressions? And when you do this, you notice that the specificity is going down considerably, meaning uh, this, uh, they are not coming from the same assemblies. That's our conclusion here. And why is the pattern size approximately only two for synchronous patterns? Well, um, we assumed a synfire chain, one synfire chain, in the volume below the array, which are about how many? one million neurons and sampled about 100 neurons randomly from therein as this were the situation when we um <coughs> when we sample with a Utah array and uh, we assumed um, we assumed uh, a synfire chain one layer of a Sampled from synchronous activity, one layer of a synfire chain. So we assume that there are different that there is a synfire chain, and if you find synchronous activity, you would expect that you sample them from one layer, yeah, uh, or one group. And um, we assume to have that many, and um, and uh, that many per group. So the, then you can calculate that the probability of sampling three neurons from one group versus two uh, is 300 times smaller. So the probability to, to randomly detect uh, from such a group two neurons is much higher than uh, larger ones. On the other hand, uh, the statistics of spade is relatively conservative. So, um, and another point is that um, I wanted to, do not want to express this so strongly, but um, I could give another talk on artifacts. Um, and uh, we don't know where they actually come from, but what we did, and I don't have a figure now for this, but <coughs> I noticed um, at some point different strange phenomena in the correlation analysis and then I asked my people to go back and look at the original time resolution of a 30th of a millisecond and make a population histogram for that. And then you see high peaks in there. 
But this can't be neuronal. The spikes have a duration of one millisecond, at least. So what we did is we could not find out what is happening on the setup and could not remove them, so to say, in terms of the setup. Probably it's some crosstalk. But what we did is we first form did this um, uh, population histogram and removed all spikes which are in a synchrony of more than two, uh, of two and more. In case to remove, to remove these artifacts. Yeah? And uh, this may have contributed also to uh, low complexity because we may have also thrown away good spikes. Yeah? But I felt bes better like this. Okay, where are we? Okay, I wanted to let you know, but don't want to go too much into this, but I wanted to let you know that we also extended the spade method to, um, to spatiotemporal patterns, meaning that you cannot only detect synchronous uh, patterns, but also patterns with a certain delay between the individual contributing spikes. Um, I hesitated for a long time to do this uh, because the problem explodes. <laughs> But we somehow, after having developed a uh, spade, we had some, somehow the mindset changed and uh, we were actually able to extend spade to this. I just want to give you again, I should have brought this figure before, much earlier. Um, so <coughs> why would I expect to get spatial temporal patterns? If you think that um, at that uh, cell assembly is somehow organized in this I as a synfire chain, so Moshe Abeles uh, invented this concept, 89, uh, 82 and 91. There are two books which we have here as well. The idea is the following. Given the connectivity we, we find in anatomy of the cortex, you have, as I said, you have a high divergence from individual neurons to other ones. And each neuron is receiving a lot of convergence from different neurons. And if you now do this for groups of neurons in different layers, you can define, so to say, groups with um, strong divergence, convergence between them. And it was known and shown in, in studies by Moshe and also others that if you stimulate the first group, for example, synchronously, that this very stably propagates as synchronous activity through this network. Very stable. Um, a synfire chain is a very, so to say, a very strict model of that kind. You can relax this also a little bit. Some people call that synfire braid, which is you don't require to have all these neurons firing synchronously to that, uh, that um, a receiving neuron is getting synchronous input, but they could be sent out at different points in time but have compensating runtimes. So you could assume different uh, delays between the neurons which are then compensated by different initiation of the spike, but still arrive synchronously at a receiving neuron. And this concept was, for example, put forward by Bienenstock, or much more known, unfortunately, and he also didn't cite Bienenstock, by Itzigevich. Um, there, of course, you would also find spatial temporal pattern, and preferably spatial temporal pattern, because you have a delay distribution here, and you would not see any synchrony in that sense anymore. Yeah? Okay. And um, we were lucky um, that we were able to extend uh, the spade analysis to also detect spatial temporal patterns. This took us about three papers that we realized that the approach we first took is actually equivalent to frequent item set mining. I don't explain all this now. But formal concept analysis in our application is basically equivalent to f uh, frequent item set mining. And so we, we could use also our whole machinery, more or less identically, but just feed in the data differently. So 
um, instead of looking for synchronous events, we first search uh, for, uh, for some patterns and then ref uh, reformat um, these data by concatenating these of one window, search window together. And then we are back to search for synchronous events. That's the rough idea. And um, however, what we had to do in order to detect um, spatial temporal patterns correctly um, is that we had to extend this spade matrix to a 3D version because um, patterns of different durations, temporal durations, have different null distributions. And so when we when we pooled patterns of, um, let's say, the same signature, like three spikes occurring five times, however of different durations, this led to uh, false positives. But we did this, we inserted this, and um, then uh, we, for when we only used the 2D spectrum, we had problems of finding really these long patterns because they are more rare for a certain allowed duration than shorter ones. And of course, you have to build this in your, um, um, your you have to consider this. And then when we adjust to a 3D spectrum, which is then number of spikes, um, their occurrence and the duration of the pattern, if we then have these kubus and test for the individual, um, hmm, pick what is this now? Uh, voxels, then we ex uh, exactly find back the patterns what we inserted. I just wanted to let you know this, that this extension exists. I can already tell you that for the data challenge, you probably don't need that, but you can, of course, play with that. Um, we also applied this in the same way to the data. And indeed, we found spatial temporal patterns. You see here the result for one session of 15 minutes, and we find the same phenomena that we find most patterns during the movement period. Here is their, uh, their complexity or the number of neurons involved. They are now going up to six or so. Um, um, but a phenomenon, and, and I want to show you here one of these patterns, which I like very much to see. So <coughs> this is, for example, a pattern one, two, three, four, of composed of five neurons. And these patterns, occurrences, are aligned here on the first spike. This is why they are on top of each other. And then you see the second and the third and the fourth and so on. And they have some temporal jitter because we allowed for three millisecond jitter of, of such a spike in the pattern. Um, so not sure if I understand. So we apply for the search a window which moves, it attaches to a spike and, and then extracts whatever there is. Yeah. Then we do the, the statistical analysis as before. And the patterns we find are within the temporal precision identical. Neuron 1 is firing at a certain time. So as I showed you here for an example, oops. So neuron 1 is firing, then neuron 2 uh, within the certain temporal jitter, and so on. Yeah? They repeat identically. And, they, uh, and what, uh, what you see here as colors is uh, showing uh, different trials, because we wanted to see how they distributed more or less homogeneously across the trials. They do. Yeah? So this is one type of pattern. And in this particular data set, we even found, uh, we found 39 different patterns. Two of two spikes, 15 of three, 11 of four, eight of five, and four of six. 
These are occurring during a particular uh, epoch in a particular behavior. Yes. No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't, but this method is available, freely available, open source in Elephant, so people could do this. Um, I am a bit hesitating to apply to look at hippocampus data because I, I, and I'm in general hesitating of downloading data and applying it because I know you need to know much more about the data than just throwing a method onto it. But uh, I agree, people found there these patterns and also are different, um, also slowing down and these type of things. It would be, this method would be extremely well suited for such analysis, yeah? One more thing I wanted to show you, a puzzle we did not solve yet. Um, now, in for these patterns, for all the patterns here, in total, were distributed uh, or here on 10 neurons. So only a small fraction of neurons actually contributed to this to these patterns. And even more surprising, and I really don't know yet what this means, that this is now a plot like the unitary events. This is one um, one epoch. <coughs> aligned on, in this case, which release, one neuron across multiple trials, and this for the different 10 neurons. And we inserted a square around the spikes, which are involved in a particular pattern at a particular time. So each color means a different pattern. Yeah. So here, for example, you see there are only pinkish squares, Somewhere there needs to be partners for this. Well, here are only red spikes, maybe with this one, maybe another one. But these, many of these spikes here have multiple squares. <sighs> uh, meaning an individual spike must be involved in different patterns. And this is still uh, <laughs> kind of confusing for me, and we need to find out what this actually means. Maybe we are actually dealing with much larger patterns, and maybe we need to merge these patterns on top of each other and see maybe clearer an expression of synfire or whatever assembly activity. Yeah, um, in principle, I agree. But um, so this, what, however, what I kind of had in mind is, well, I have an assembly, and then this set of neurons are is composing the assembly, and so I would see only patterns from those, and then another set of neurons, which is uh, somehow I intuitively thought they need to be um, separate. Yeah, but obviously it more happens what I thought is that um, they seem to multiplex. Yeah? Just a second. Go ahead. Well, you could try to, and this is what people do, reduce calcium imaging to kind of point processes. Time scale is different, you need to be aware of, but I think it should be worth to apply it. There were more questions. <laughs> so what what's your point? <laughs> I think so. Mm. 
Which paper is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, that's interesting. Paulina? I think I said this, didn't I? Ah, okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, they are both phenomena. Then individual neurons are, for example, this one. This has not. This has many differently colored spikes. This seems to li like a kind of a hub neuron being involved in different patterns, but not the individual spikes. But this and this has spikes involved in different patterns. Yeah. I I I agree, but this all does not. I mean, if you come, I'm I'm long enough in this field to have experienced this uh, fight between rate and uh, time uh, temporal coding, yeah. And people, the rate phil <laughs> rate people are still very strong, and this would not fit into their philosophy at all. Yes. <laughs> okay, it could be that maybe for example one neuron is not firing in the pattern like ours, but it has a long time assembly. And then you would kind of split these different patterns and have another one for the because in the hand is not spiking in the pattern and the line is not spiking in the pattern and these different separate patterns and so it's a couple in the This is what we think is happening and this is what we are going to do next to, m to merge them and to see whether these are actually composing a bigger pattern yeah can we go on a little bit I want to show you one more method can you still concentrate it's hard for me but <laughs> 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 okay then um, yeah. It's a good question. We don't know yet. It's a very good question. Because somehow you lose this uh, perspective here because you need to... Um, but yes, you are right. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Whether there are neurons which are always, so to say, starting a pattern or yeah, yeah, something like this. Mm? <coughs> okay, so I I realize you are tired. I want to then I show you just a picture that you get the idea what we also have in our package and um, which you may have applications for, and I will not explain this in detail to you. Um, so we were having, I have always in mind this SYNFIRE model, and if you were able to record all neurons from the SYNFIRE model, then you would probably see something like this. So different neurons, time, and if such a SYNFIRE chain like this is uh, active and you record many neurons per group 
then you would probably see uh, sequences of synchronous activity. So here, assuming you have a, a more complete sampling. Yeah? And if the synfire train is activated again, you would see this, um, this activation of, of these groups of neurons one after the other again. And um, this is actually a, a simpler task in a way, as looking for spatial temporal pattern. Spatial temporal pattern would be, so to say, a sparse sampling of this, but here you have better chances to detect this. And um, a simple approach, which we started to develop already 2008, um, is that what we could do is the following. <coughs> Re really easy to understand. Um, we take this time axis and again bin it in the potential width of these synchronous groups, let's say three milliseconds. And now we compare any, any of these, the contents of these bins, whether we have overlapping neuron IDs. Yeah? And in particular, if I would have a bin here and a bin here comparing, then the overlap of the active neurons is pretty high. Right? And what you can do is insert this neuron overlap in a matrix which compares any two times bins, uh, bins in time. Yeah? So for example, um, for example, this here would be the comparison of this bin at T2 and this bin at T1, and we would find a, ho a strong overlap. And if we had such a feature that we have propagating synchronous activity, then also the next bin con keeping these, uh, co detecting these neurons and these neurons would uh, have a high overlap, resulting effectively in diagonal structures within such a matrix with a high entry. Yeah, that's the old, this, that's the idea behind. And what we did in, in this method um, published in, which we called ASSET, um, uh, published as Torre et al, is basically m uh, finding a way to automatically uh, identify such diagonal structures in, in such matrices. This involved a number of steps, but I, um, I this is just the idea I wanted to give you, and you are welcome to apply this method as well but I will now skip the details. Okay. Um, discussion. I showed you different ways of approaching such massively parallel data. What uh, one was the simplest, using a population histogram looking at the, com the complexity distribution and compare this distribution to the one of independent data. It's easy to compute and it provides at least an indication of a presence of correlation. Uh, a method I didn't show to you um, is cubic, um, which, is, um, which can infer a lower bound of higher order correlations. Um, it just tells you seven, then you know you have some correlation of at least seven. Then uh, I showed you um, uh, the, the method spade, where we can detect higher order synchrony or spatial temporal patterns, where you have the neuron IDs resolved, which are participate, which are these patterns, and also their time of occurrence. And I <coughs> hinted to you to the method uh, for detection of sequences of synchronous events by ACID, for which holds the more neurons you observe, the better is the detection. And this is more or less what I wanted to tell you. Here is um, um, a uh, kind of a review paper where you can, so to say, look at the comparison of the different methods and here I want to thank the people of my group. Thank you very much. <laughs>